Hello and uh, very welcome to today's seminar to be given by Eric Kullhed. Eric studied Greek and Latin philology at Stockholm University, Uppsala University and Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa. He received his PhD in Greek from Uppsala University in 2014 and was promoted to associate professor, docent, at the same university in 2018. Now, Eric Kullhed's PhD thesis on the 12th century rhetorician Eftatios of Thessalonike's commentary on the Odyssey received the Benzelius Award by the Royal Society of Sciences in Uppsala and the Westin Prize by the same society, the latter for a particularly deserving so, uh, doctoral thesis. After his PhD, he also moved into new fields of research, publishing articles on ancient Homeric scholarship, Byzantine satire, classical reception in Latin America, the history of classical scholarship, late antique Latin poetry, and the history of the emotion or emotional state of being moved. The breadth of Eric Kullhed's knowledge and scholarly expertise is remarkable. He moves with ease between the Homeric epics, Roman rhetoric, and Byzantine literature, while combining his philological research on Greek texts with approaches from philosophical and psychological aesthetics, emotion studies, and cognitive linguistics. His publications meet high scholarly standards and are frequently cited internationally. Among his publications, I'd like to mention the article Movement and Sound on the Shield of Achilles in Ancient Exegesis in the journal Greek, Roman, and Byzantine Studies from 2014. And the chapter Born with the Wrinkles of Byzantium, Unclassical Traditions in Spanish America, 1815 to 1925 which appeared in the book Antiquities and Classical Traditions in Latin America, edited by Laird and Miller and published in 2018 by Wiley. This collection is, I believe, the first concerted attempt to explore the significance of classical legacies for Latin American history. As a token of his contributions to research, he was awarded the Oscar Prize in 2018 by the board of Uppsala University. And this prize is awarded each year to two researchers at Uppsala University whose scientific writing is the most deserving and offers the greatest promise of continued academic work. He also contributes to share academic findings more broadly by way of translation works, essays, and artistic work, including poetry. And as a Profitura Ciencia Fellow, Eric Kullhead works with a research project analyzing and classifying thick aesthetic concepts in Greek and Roman criticism. So our warmest welcome to Eric Kullhead, please. <clears throat> Yes, and thanks to all of you for, for coming. Um, I would like to devote this uh, afternoon to an old piece of pottery, to this little wine jug, uh, which you can see for yourself if you ever visit the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. Uh, it is one of several objects that were excavated during rather obscure circumstances in 1871 in the area of Plataea Eleftherias in the same city. For all of these objects, there are unfortunately no notebooks or plans that can tell us anything about the context in which uh, they were found, so you won't find me referencing this, and that's the reason we don't really know. But on a more positive note, the characteristic design of the jug itself is fairly easy to assign uh, to a specific uh, time and place. For the most part, as you can see here, its decorations consist of these concentric lines and these thicker bands, uh, and this sawtooth uh, pattern, um, 
except for the neck, where we find this panel with an image of a grazing stag. And this stylistic combination of abstract patterns with some figurative uh, elements and the overall look of it is typical for the so-called late geometric period, which lasted from the mid-8th century to the 7th century before the Common Era in Athens. And in fact, we can find many very similar vessels that clearly originate from the exact same workshop. So here, for the purpose of illustration, you have our wine jug on the uh, left, or on your uh, right, perhaps, uh, paired with uh, another vessel of a similar function, size, shape, and decoration uh, on the right. No, of course. So this is the deep on jug on the left, and a parallel on, on the right. Um, in other words, we're dealing with a typical 8th century Athenian wine jug that would hardly seem worthy of uh, your time I mean, uh, here. And yet it is a tremendously famous object, and the scholarly literature on it is vaster than any other piece of pottery from the ancient world, with some few uh, exceptions. And the reason for this is that a graffito was etched into the dark band that runs along the shoulders of the vessel at some point after it was fired, probably sooner rather than... Uh, than later, and if you want to, wa sort of we can discuss more why we might think that in the Q and A. Um, this makes it one of the oldest preserved Greek and hence European alphabetic inscriptions that we have. So, for any historian of human literacy and writing in general, it is a crucial piece of evidence. This little pot. Um, a large part of the scholarly literature has been devoted to this final puzzling segment of the inscription, which might simply be nonsense, and I'd be happy to uh, return to this if any of you is curious about what to do with this. But during the talk itself, I will focus on the first 41 letters of the inscription, which can safely be read as follows. Hosnin orcheston panton ataloatapaitse and then follows this nonsense. So he of all the dancers who now dances atalotata, I will leave that uh, untranslated so far, to him this, and then follows again these five letters. So the inscription clearly indicates that something, supposedly the jug itself, served as a trophy for the winner in a dance competition. And this event probably took place in the 8th century BC in Athens, as one may infer, not only from the place of production and excavation that I've gone through, but also from the fact that this is in the Attic Greek dialect. So orchestron of the dancers would otherwise be uh, orchestaon in, in epic Ionic Greek. And the question uh, I want to consider here is not about the inscription itself, but about the dance contest that it refers to. We know virtually nothing about 8th century Athenian dance culture, so we if we can squeeze, ke squeeze some kind of information, some kind of somewhat reliable information out of this uh, object that might be worthwhile, at least for some people. And I will proceed with uh, this in four steps. First, um, uh, I will argue that the answer hinges primarily on our interpretation of this single word that I left untranslated, namely atalotata. Uh, second, I will examine the general meaning of the word atalos in archaic epic, Third, I will situate this interpretation in the specific context of Greek dance aesthetics. And finally, I will briefly reconsider the evidential value of the material characteristics of the jug itself and previous uh, theories on this. So, the first thing we need to uh, pay attention to is what kind of utterance are we dealing in the first place. Note that the sentence has a certain metrical form, namely dactylic hexameter. So to exaggerate the pronunciation a bit, it reads hos nu norgeston panton atalo tatapaitse to tode, and so on. Furthermore, in the 1970s, the American linguist and philologist Calvert Watkins demonstrated, quote, that every word and every morpheme in this sentence is placed according to the canons of epic formulaic and metrical practice. And he also identified parallels to this kind of competition announcement in Hittite and uh, Vedic texts for what it's worth. And this thoroughly traditional and formulaic character of the language, at least as indicated by the analysis of the meter, suggests that we are 
dealing not just with any strings of words, but in fact with a snippet from a bardic song produced with the technique needed to, uh, to sing epic po po poetry. Uh, we may also note that the deictic now, noon, and this is what uh, a scholar named Eric Havelock pointed out, it has to mark a transition from some presupposed then, or some then that happened, that is probably from some other kind of activity and the forthcoming event. So what kind of event is about to take place? We do not know much about when, why, or how Athenians danced in this period, but we do have products of the poetic tradition uh, that dominated their cultural landscape, namely the Iliad and the Odyssey and other archaic epic poems that include idealizing descriptions of dance set in a mythical uh, past, but probably presenting us with an ideal that they try to approximate in their actual practices. So that might be a... Uh, we might suppose that. In the Odyssey, so one of the great epics of the archaic Greek period, uh, there is this account of an elaborate feast arranged by the king of Phaeacia in order to entertain the Greek warrior Odysseus, who is shipwrecked on this island of Phaeacia uh, on his long and arduous journey back home to Ithaca from the Trojan War. And in this scene, the blind bard uh, appears and first sings a heroic war narrative and then uses his lyre to accompany different forms of dancing and acrobatics and then performs yet another epic song and so on. Likewise, in the great Homeric epic, the Iliad, the god of metalworking, makes a shield to the foremost hero of the Greeks, Achilles. And on the surface of this shield, he depicts, among many wondrous things, festivities where Bards sing and play the lyre, while one form of dancing or acrobatics follow after another. In other words, we should probably imagine some sort of public or private festivity in 8th century Athens, where a bard acted as DJ and MC, as it were. So he accompanying various musical athletic activities, and at some point he stops and announces that it is now time to make way for some new kind of performance. And then at some later moment, uh, this living announcement was etched into the surface of the wine jug in order to mark it as a trophy and commemorate this event. But does it specify what kind of dancing that the audience and judges should expect to see next? Now there are three words in the inscription that refers to performers or the anticipated spectacle. There are atalotata, there's orchestron and there's paetze. And despite many attempts to argue otherwise, the last two words appear to offer no specific information, since we find them uh, used uh, rather neutrally in reference to all kinds of different dancing in archaic texts. Uh, so here are some examples that uh, have been proposed. Cal Calvert Watkins again, so the same philologist that I mentioned earlier, he argued that the word orchestes, dancer, and the word orchis, testicle, both derive from the same uh, Indo-European root, reg, uh, uh, but I can't really pronounce this uh, laryngeal, of course, uh, which means mount, and hypothesized that the semantics of orcheomai developed from denoting sex to erotic dancing to simply dancing. And Watkins is not alone in associating the Dipilon uh, inscription with another set of late archaic inscriptions. And these are a group of famous graffiti found on the island of Thera, so Santorini today. And they are carved on the rocks flanking the terrace in front of uh, a temple to uh, Apollo Delphinios, uh, later Apollo Carneos. And here we encounter exclamations of praise for specific dancers or boys. And these are quite typical uh, for uh, I mean, we find these kinds of inscriptions also in classical age on Athenian pots and so on. Uh, it says, Helicrates is a good dancer, Eumelos is the best dancer, Lacedidas is great, he's beautiful, Picomedes is the best, and so on. Uh, but among these, we also find uh, comments of a more sexual nature, I mean, comments which has this more truck stop, bath uh, room kind of uh, quality to, 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 to them, such as Phaedipi um, uh, Idas had sex, Timagoras and Theres and I had sex, these things, Empilos, a fornicator, Empedocles engraved these words and he danced by Apollo. So this kind of association in this specific culture around Apollo, both with dancing, uh, male beauty uh, and acts of, of, of sex between these, uh, the people, the dancers uh, and others involved in this context. But it is far from clear uh, 
that there is some connection between our jug, our Athenian jug, and these inscriptions made half a century later on an island 300 kilometers away. Nor is it clear that our Athenian dancing took place in a similar erotic context, uh, except for this general association. And the etymology of orchestes offered by Watkins is not widely accepted anymore. Uh, and more importantly, perhaps, in early Greek hexameter poetry, the verb orcheomai and its cognates have no clear sexual connotations, but it is used of all kinds of dancing in the texts that we had and that would have been performed at the same time that, that this inscription dates from. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite unlikely that it has any such information. In a similar fashion, it has been argued that this verb paitse does not refer to dancing at all, uh, but rather to the sexual activity of a young beloved. So paitse should be taken, so paitse is, uh, I mean, sometimes uh, connected to pais, um, to child, to playing, and then perhaps playing in the sense uh, uh, has sex. So he, he who has sex the best is really not about dan dancing. Uh, that has been proposed. Uh, but more often it has been argued that the verb <laughs> does refer to dancing, but it has to be translated as sport, or uh, be playful, or be dynamic. But just as in the case of Orchestes, when we look at parallels in early Greek epic, uh, they do not allow us these attestations to limit its meaning to any particular mode of dancing. So Nausicaa paitse, I mean with a ball on the beach, but also um, if we look, for instance, in this acrobatic scene on which I already mentioned, this banquet in the Odyssey, Paitse is used about this uh, uh, exuberant acrobatic performance, uh, and also, for instance, a wedding dance in the Odyssey in which adult men and women uh, dance uh, to celebrate uh, a marriage. So it's very hard to tie it to this particular genre. Naturally, of course, these observations cannot rule out that the dancing commemorated on the Deep Illinois was indeed playful or erotically suggestive. It's just that these words, orchiston and pied say, it's not uh, sufficient to substantiate any such claim. This means that we must focus our attention on this word, atalotata, a superlative form of the adjective atalos, that functions as an adverbial to Paitse, indicating the way in which the winner should dance. But the problem is that the meaning of this word is far from, uh, from clear. Without explicitly reflecting on the matter, many scholars have translated the inscription as a claim that the prize belongs to the dancer who uh, performs most gracefully or most elegantly. And that's how we should translate atalotata. And by their very nature, aesthetic evaluative terms such as these are, as we will uh, see, um, notoriously hard to define. But elegance and grace tend to connote maturity uh, and refinement. Of course, I, usually I could just rely on my own uh, intuitions for this, but nowadays there's uh, empirical <laughs> aesthetic research uh, which actually try to sort of figure this out through these uses of semantic differentials. So this is an article from the Max Planck Institute of Empirical uh, Aesthetics uh, led by Winfried Menninghaus. So for what it's worth, uh, in this they use free association and questionnaire methods, uh, and they conclude that uh, their participants associated the German words elegance and anmut with impressions of lightness, fluency, exquisiteness, and artful simplicity. And when applied to people, it was primarily linked to adults in the third to six decades of, uh, of life. Whereas the adjective atalos in Greek culture is typically applied to young animals and children, often very young uh, children. So this seems to go, go, go against, uh, and perhaps your intuitions about elegance and grace are the same. It's typically uh, not, not something we would speak about when we talk about uh, how, a children appear, how, ch how a child appears to us, that is very elegant. Other suggestions who have taken this fact into account, that it's usually ascribed to chil children, they have tended to pick some quality that we usually ascribe to children and suggest that atalotata might mean most dynamically, most softly, most daintily, most delicately, or most sweetly. But is it possible to arrive at a more precise definition of this quality that atalos could refer to? Leaving aside the difficult question of etymology, the standard definitions of the adjective atalos that we encounter in dictionaries, uh, such as kindlish, sart, or tender, delicate, or tender, delicate, and youthful, are difficult except when we consider what the less ambiguous denominative verbs atalo and atitalo 
reveal about their adjectival base. So this is where the presentation gets a bit technical, but the result of this part uh, is important for the rest of the arg argument, so I will try to set it out as a form of equation and hope you can follow with me. So we don't know the exact meaning of the word atalos, but it is clear that in archaic epic the verb atallo denotes the frolicking of animals and children, so it always means to frolic. Then comes something more confusing. In later authors, it can also note the act of providing care, shelter, or nourishment. Then there is also the verb atitalo, which can only denote the act of providing care, shelter, and nourishment. Uh, it can never mean frolic. The Oxford philologist Peter Barber has observed that the denominative verbs formed with uh, this suffix that appears in, uh, in uh, atalo, um, based on adjectives with a theme argument semantics, have a factative relation to their base. So this means that all adjectives that ascribe to something the property of being in a certain state, if you take an adjective like that and form a verb with this suffix, it will result in a verb um, that signifies the act of causing something to be in that state. So for example, poikilos, which means variegated, it says something about in what state this this thing is. It will produce poikillo in the sense to variegate, so to cause something to become poikillos. That's what will happen with these adjectives. But this is not the case, Barbara observes, with verbs formed with the exact same suffix, so in the same way, from adjectives with an agent or experiencer argument, so adjectives that ascribe the property to something of acting or being acted upon in a certain way. So take, for example, kotilos, which is not a state, but uh, a, a capacity, uh, persuasive. It has the property of being capable of persuading. And in these cases, um, the resulting verb, when you add this little uh, 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 I mean, uh, suffix and create a verb out of it, kotilo uh, does not mean to make someone persuasive, as in the case with the other kinds of verbs, but rather it means to persuade, to perform the action that the adjective uh, describes. So, if we suppose that atallo follows this pattern, and we have every re reason to believe that it does, then the resulting verb um, cannot have been formed from an adjective carrying the theme meaning tender, delicate, youthful, as all of the standard lexica say. Since the resulting verb would have had been factative, so it would have mean to make someone tender, to make someone delicate, to make someone beautiful. And we know that that's not, not the case. It always means to frolic. Therefore, it seems more reasonable to conclude that atalos must have had the experiencer meaning carefree or untroubled, or the agent meaning playful, in order to produce atalo in this sense, frolic. Um, and that's how we should uh, interpret the word from now on, I believe. And the fact that atalo confusingly also means take care of is a problem, but it can easily be explained as a result of later confusion of atalo with this other verb that I mentioned, atitalo. The latter verb was originally formed by reduplication from atalo to be careful, free, in order to make it uh, factative. Uh, to make someone carefree, that is to sustain that creature's carefree existence, to take care of it. And this is a common function of this kind of reduplication. So in Greek there's a verb, for instance, theistai, uh, uh, to, to suck, to suck milk, but tithene, uh, with uh, this reduplication, is the nurse who, who, who provides this. So it's even, I mean, semantically quite close. And then in a final stage, perhaps this verb atitalo, which is much more common than atalo, there's only, I think, four or five at the state, the state stations, perhaps it began to inf influence atalo, giving it this anomalous meaning of take care in some post-archaic uh, texts. Uh, but the only way to find out that this whole picture uh, is correct is, of course, to go into the attestations of the word atalos uh, down to the classical age, uh, and I won't go through all of them, but just take a few uh, examples to see, I mean, to exemplify uh, how I uh, proceed with these interpretations. So first of all, there's this very famous scene in the Iliad in which the doomed Trojan warrior Hector leaves the battlefield and is temporarily reunited with his wife and baby son within the walls of the city that he is defending. 
Uh, and in this scene, the child, uh, young as Dianax, is called Atala minded. So with Atala things in mind, which is immediately followed up with he was just a child and he was beloved like a beautiful star. And Hector, in response, uh, he smiles in silence when he looks upon his child. So we are supposed to apprehend this Dianax life as something precious and something uh, adorable uh, when he's called Atala minded. But we're also encouraged to perceive these qualities in the light of the child's impending destruction. We know that his parents' worst fear about the boy's future will inevitably be realized. He will be hurled from the city wall by some Greek so tr soldier trying to capture Troy. Uh, so the point is that for the moment the child is nurtured, amused, cared for and protected. He's blissfully oblivious of the dangers that he is facing. And an interpretation of Atala Froneon as carefree in mind would, I think, uh, fit this context. Second, in the harvest scene depicted on the shield of Achilles, the phrase Atala Froneontes again, so Atala minded with Atala things in mind or so on, is applied to young adults carrying grapes and in the same or the next image, it's never very clear in this uh, shield of Achilles, they dance around a child singing a dirge with a delicate voice, beating the ground and following the rhythm with shouts and joyful capering. So here too, the context emphasizes freedom from cares. This and other images uh, are there to contrast with images of war and strife on the shield, of lions attacking cattle, and of course of the theme of the Iliad in general. So these descriptions of dancing children as atalafroneontes could mean that they are carefree in their minds. They neglect their mortality and the painful realities that human life uh, will inevitably involve. Turning to the Iliad and the Odyssey, when Odysseus travels to the underworld and summons the spirits uh, down from, from the house of Hades, these ghosts include brides and young unmarried men and much enduring elders and virgins, atalai, with hearts new to sorrow. So in this scene, the pairing of atalai, virgins, with much enduring elders suggests that both kinds of death and afterlife are piteous in their own way. Old men arrive in Hades after these long lives uh, of hardship, whereas virgins come to this grim place carefree, their hearts forever unaccustomed to the grief and pain that they must now eternally sustain. And to take a slightly la later and final example, in the Homeric hymn to Demeter, the goddess Hecate is still a child, Atala Froneusa, so Atala minded, when she hears the scream of Persephone being abducted. So here too there is this contrast between a previous carefree life of a child who has never known any troubles and then this sudden calamity of rape that uh, she becomes uh, witness to. And in fact, in virtually all archaic classical examples in which the word occurs, it refers to a young carefree child in a context that stresses delight, um, some for the delight that it offers to its caretaker, so like Hector who smiles and so on, but also some sort of doom in the future. It is used about Ajax's son before his father's suicide in Sophocles. Uh, it is used about Phaeton before he is abducted by Aphrodite. It is used about Medea's uh, little brother before he is ambushed and murdered by, by Jason in Apollonius of Rhodes. And it is used in an epigram about a sweet child skipping over a frozen river before he falls into the water and gets decapitated by a swiftly flowing ice of, I mean, flow of ice. So there's al almost always this intense touch of, of doom in perhaps 90% of the KK cases, which is curious. Translators and lexicographers often use this word, uh, English word, uh, innocent, to translate atalos in these contexts. And perhaps this is as close as we can get if we want to use a single English word, but to understand the difference we need to clarify what kind of concepts that these two words uh, represent. It is useful in this regard to pay attention to a basic distinction between di three different kinds of concepts that was popularized by Bernard Williams in his work Ethics and the Limits of Philosophy, uh, a distinction which has had uh, some importance in meta-ethics and aesthetics during the last three uh, decades. So on the on one hand, uh, we have uh, these descriptive con uh, concepts such as fast or 159 centimeters tall or, or spiky, which we use. If I call a snail fast or I call myself 159 centimeters long or I call a 
perfect circle, spiky. It can be objected that I'm getting some basic fact about the world wrong. It's not spiky, it's round, it's not, and so on. On the other hand, um, we have evaluative concepts, such as good, right, or beautiful. If someone calls this presentation that I'm giving good, or the death penalty right, or the new university building across the street beautiful, these claims can surely be disputed, but these would be epistemic, ethical, or aesthetic debates. It would not be a matter of having misunderstood what good means and so on, as in the case with, with Spikey. But there are also concepts that unite fact and value, such as clear about an argument or just about some action or elegant about uh, a car, for instance. And these express some sort of evaluation, like the words in your column on the right, but like the words in the column on the left, our applications of them can also be criticized as to whether they get something right or wrong. If we call a Heraclitean aphorism clear, a corrupted judge just, or a kitschy garden gnome elegant, we have misunderstood what these words mean, and yet they are uh, evaluative. Uh, so the English word innocent should be analyzed, I think, as, as a word belonging to this uh, middle category, as, a, as a representing a thick uh, concept, or perhaps different thick concepts, depending on use. Um, but it can be used with different emphases. Its Latin etymology, that which has caused no harm, points to a lack of guilt in a legal and moral sense. But we can also use it in a morally more neutral way to denote the epistemic property of lacking experience and hence being gullible or perhaps malleable or instructable and so on. And it can also pick out an aesthetic property of appearing ingenious or unpretentious in some way when we speak of uh, innocent colors or an innocent melody or, or something like that. Now these are considered to be good things perhaps insofar as it is fitting to favor those who have done nothing wrong, to trust those who show no sign of affectation or to provide instruction and care for those who we find naive and immature in some sense. Um, turning to this archaic Greek notion of atalos, it is very uh, uh, similar to that. This is not some sort of formal chart, it's just me putting out my uh, associations uh, on uh, on this uh, PowerPoint. Um, but first of all, it is not as obvious that any kind of ethical evaluation is involved, that no sort of moral guilt is there in something that is at a loss. It may be naturally so, but it's, it doesn't seem to be important or primary. Instead, its descriptive components consist in this blissful lack of experience and worries because one is still supported by, by a caregiver. And it seems to be associated with a capacity to elicit attachment emotions, uh, similar in that regard to a word like cute or adorable or sweet. Um, uh, but unlike innocence, perhaps, we find that the transitoriness and the vulnerability inherent to this quality is almost always stressed and elaborated uh, by the poets. So this is more in the side of connotations, perhaps, that this carefree existence of infants is blissful and, and cute. But unlike the everlasting carefree existence of, of the gods, who are also the other typical uh, creatures who are carefree in, 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 in these uh, tales, uh, this kind of carefreeness is by definition ephemeral, defenseless, and it causes a sense of compassion and poignancy that the poets often exploit. So perhaps poignantly sweet carefreeness is needed to fully capture the notion um, with all of its typical uh, connotations in the epic. But that is, of course, more of a paraphrase. So let us consider what this might mean when we turn it into an aesthetic context, because in these other uh, uh, con I mean, examples that I have mentioned, it's always about a child or a virgin or a ghost or so on. It's never about a dance or a piece of music or something like that. So like Ares' mythical apple, pledged to the most beautiful in the myth, the Kaliste at the banquet of the gods, our singer, who announced this dancing competition in 8th century Athens, did not invoke this thin, purely evaluative aesthetic concept that caused this, uh, this stir among the goddesses, who is the finest goddess, but they are, of course, fine in different ways. But it introduced a thick uh, one in order to specify the criterion by which the judges were to assess the competing performers in this context. So that is, you need to excel, not just in general, but in the quality of dancing atalotata, of dancing with the highest degree of poignantly sweet carefulness. 
The only example besides the Dipilon wine jug in which the word atalos is used in connection to dancing is the harvest scene on uh, the shield of Achilles uh, that I have already mentioned. And admittedly, the adjective is not used here to modify the dancing itself, uh, but the phrase atalaminda denotes the sweetly carefree spirit of boys and girls as they carry grapes in baskets before proceeding to this dancing. It is perhaps not unreasonable to think that the whole image is a manifestation of this quality or that their gait, at least as they approach the dancing, has this, uh, this uh, property. In the dance, the children beat the ground in unison and they follow the music capering on the feet. So posi skyrontes. And this verb skyro is otherwise used about the frolicking of calves, perhaps their sort of slightly awkward rotary canter, uh, when they joyously rum... Uh, uh, jump about their mothers when they return from pasture, uh, or about dancing maidens who move with a joyous spirit, so euphronithymo in the Homeric hymn to Mother Earth. So the dance um, so far appears to be, perhaps we could say that it should be executed in a way that suggests exaltation and uh, immaturity, if we are to lead this verb uh, skyro, used in connection to uh, atalos, but that might not be very persuasive. Uh, chain of association. So in the absence of further instances in which the word atalos itself is used about dancing or other aesthetic phenomena, we must ask whether the thick concept that it represents, so that is this poignantly sweet carefreeness, is expressed by other means in contexts where dance performers are applauded for manifesting this aesthetic property. And such examples can, I think, be found, and I will show you some examples of this. In the fragment restored in 2004 by the Greek 6th century poet Sappho, the singer addresses a group of children in a musical context and reflects on the process of aging. So this is the, the, the fragment that was reconstructed. The violet rich muses find gifts, children, the clear voiced song loving lyre, my body which used to be old age has now and my hair has turned from black into bright white. My heart has been he made heavy, my knees do not carry, those which were once nimble to dance like the knees of fawns. So the poet is no longer soft, her color is no longer vibrant, and her mental organ, her themos here rendered uh, heart, has grown heavy. And this weight hinders her from dancing with the same kind of appeal that the girls that she is addressing can achieve, so with knees like those of a baby deer. And the common property of the target and the source of this simile is not merely speed or agility. They could have used a grown-up deer or a faster animal or whatever, but clearly also this naive and joyous spirit of a fawn, still not checked by the psychological weight and burden of old age. And the poem continues... How often I lament these things, but what can you do? No being that is human can escape old age, for people used to think that dawn with rosy arms carried Tithonus to the edges of the earth, a fine and young man, yet still grey old age in time did seize him, being the husband of a deathless wife. So note here that the value of this charming naivete is amplified by a poignant emphasis on its ephemeral nature. The poem says, I am old, all mortals grow old. Young Tithonus was abducted from this world by a goddess because of his youthful beauty, but he too grew old in a most pitiable and terrible way. In this respect too, the fawn dancer simile is reminiscent of these scenes where epic poets uses the word uh, atalos. To give a few more examples, in, late, in the later archaic age we find bounding fawns depicted together with dancing and aulos playing girls on Krateriskoi from, Acropolis, uh, from the Acropolis and the Agora. And in the classical period, fawn dancer and deer dancer similes are well attested. And in his ode for the Agonitan wrestling victory at the games of Nemea in 485 or 483, the poet Bacchylides conjures up this image of another artist singing the praise of the island that this victor who has won this wrestling match or this pankration match hails from. So in the middle of Bacchylides' song, he imagines this other performer and says, Some high and proud girl sings in praise of your might, often leaping lightly on her feet as a carefree fawn 
towards the flowery banks with her illustrious near-dwelling companions. So here, the imagined young female performer singing Egina's praise is compared to a fawn, and again, not only because of her agility, but explicitly because of her freedom from sorrows. So the fawn here is a pentheus. It ha has no, no penthos, no, no sorrow. She's untroubled, a quality unavailable, we might suppose, to an older artist like Beculides himself. A slightly darker emphasis on the precarious nature of this vulnerable charm is found in Euripides' Bacchae, where the chorus expresses their longing to dance, to move their feet and toss their heads towards the sky like a fawn as it rejoices after escaping the hunter. The triumphant joy of the prey animal, and this is a triumph of escape rather than conquest, is emphatically impermanent. It involves a neglect of the danger one has evaded and a joy unchecked by dismal awareness of one's, fragi of one's fragility or by anxiety about similar dangers in the future. Finally, I will mention this interesting philosophical reflection on manifestations of youthfulness in dance found in Plato's Laws. In order to illustrate why some people might get the, in his view, totally mistaken idea that aesthetic value is grounded in pressure, on pleasure rather than virtue, the Athenian stranger, a character in this dialogue, asks, Is it not the case that the young among us are capable of participating in choral performance, while those of us who are elders think the proper way to conduct ourselves is as their audience, taking pleasure in their dancing and revelry, now that we are abandoned by our own lightness, which we long for and cling to, and therefore arrange competitions for those who are most able to excite us to juvenescence through memory. The point of this uh, counterexample that the Athenian stranger presents is understandable within this larger context. So the Athenian stranger goes on to observe that all young creatures have a fiery nature and that they are unable to sit still or keep quiet but scream and leap about as though they were mad and dancing in playful glee. Among all the animals only human beings have received the gift of rhythm and harmony from the gods, and it is through this long process of musical education that their voices and movement will eventually attain some sort of order. However, there are certain qualities, and that's why this example is brought up, such as playful revelry, lightness to elafron, and juvenescence, neotis, that can only be enjoyed if perceived in performers that are in fact closer to this natural starting point, which music and gymnastics uh, proceed from. Uh, which they are actually there to sort of regulate. So in performers that have less art and skill, but more simplicity and sp spontaneity in and, and youth. And Plato suggests that we take vicarious pleasure, not the highest kind of pleasure, but a worthwhile pleasure nonetheless, in displays of sheer youth, because we have all had and lost this quality. That seems to be the point of this passage at least. Interestingly, it is not only a sweet and nostalgic experience, but there is also something revivifying about the way in which young carefree dancers induce us to resonate with their movements through effective and motor uh, cognition that sort of comes through in this passage. So this might be something that we might add to this aesthetics of, of dancing at a loss. It's not only this poignant sweetness, but perhaps also this feeling of resonating with uh, a youthful movement pattern that we are no longer capable of ourselves, perhaps. It is natural to ask at the end of uh, this section of the talk, to what extent texts from the early 6th and the late 4th centuries, which completely lacks the lexeme atalos, can shed any light on the dance contest commemorated by our 8th century inscription. My answer here is that I invoke them merely to illustrate what this thick effective concept could plausibly mean when uniquely employed to denote an aesthetic ideal within the realm of dancing in Greek archaic uh, culture. In epic poetry, atalos denotes the sweet carefreeness of children. Extending it to a dance performance suggests a capacity to move one's body in a manner expressive of naive rejoicing and lacking in mature composure. The winner of this competition, we might suppose, had to dance in a way more spontaneous than restrained, more agile than firm and solemn. This was not the aim of all choral performances, and that's quite... Uh, 
uh, important to stress, I think. We should not take this inscription as a general uh, point about how dance should be in general. It must be contrasted with the well-trained flashing feet uh, and the display of dazzling acrobatics in Skeria, in this scene in the Odyssey that I alluded to. It must also be contrasted with the stately, blameless, adult dancing uh, on Ithaca. It was not an energetic Pyrrhic war dance in arms, and not an intricate labyrinthine Geranos dance. It was a less wondrous, less dignified, less powerful, less complex, but perhaps more uh, adorable kind of performance. And it's also important to point out that this was a dance competition, of course, but in a cultural context where sports, art forms, entertainments, education, religion, and so on were not, I mean, as discreetly compartmentalized to different uh, institutions and rooms as, uh, as in our culture. We're at the theater, but we are also at school, and the competition has a clear pedagogic aim to teach Athenian children to control their movements as to produce specific artistic qualities and to start building a body language vocabulary of expressive gates and gestures. And this is an obvious desideratum uh, in modern Western dance education as well. Um, uh, for instance, uh, in, in the following exercise in Marianne Lee's resource guide for teaching dance from kindergarten through the fifth grade. Um, so it is a dance based on the famous moral folk tale about the Chinese emperor and this honest uh, child that comes to the emperor with his empty pot. Uh, and the story is chosen in order to teach a contrast between uh, dancing with abandon and dancing with solemnity. So after asking the children to perform both roles to different beats, the teacher should say, and this is what, uh, what this sort of book of... Uh, is research, uh, sort of teaching resource guides, recommends us as dance teachers. Say to the children, uh, now compare the movement qualities of the carefree children who danced among the plants to those of the all-powerful emperor, whose movement qualities are sharp, percussive, and strong. Let's try 16 counts of lively skipping, and eight slow counts of sharp, percussive, and powerful movement. Be sure to use your arms and your back. Let your eyes go with your dance. Let me see the difference between the two qualities. So this would be a method to teach children to move their bodies in these ways. Um, it is this kind of aesthetic, but also edifying activity that is inscribed verse and nonsense. It is even the same quality, of course, childish carefreeness that is being taught. And I have argued that we should be careful, of course, to just project our cultural connotations that we have with, with carefreeness onto Greek carefreeness. And more specifically, I have speculated that the appropriate effective response to a display of childish carefreeness might have had this bittersweet tone. In epic, Atalos is almost always used in situations charged with dark forebodings, and of course there is no reason to think that a dance performance perceived at Atalos had any such connotations of, of doom, that would be strange. However, the frequent use of the short-lived joy of the prey animal, the fawn, as an image of the dancer moving with a carefree abandon of a child in later archaic and classical sources, might offer some kind of clue about the particular aesthetic value ascribed to this kind of performance that resided partly in its power to elicit not only a contagious sense of carefulness and protective feelings of tenderness, but also poignant reflections uh, and emotions in response to fragility and the impermanence of carefulness. But admittedly, this is not hinted at in the verse inscribed on the jug, just a uh, general inductive claim based on other artifacts in archaic and Greek culture. So coming to this short final section, uh, so far I have only considered these words of the inscription as a fragment of living oral poetry in its original function as an announcement. And I think that it's important to sort of uh, ignore the materiality of this thing, as it is an oral uh, product, this inscription. Uh, as a piece of preparatory dance criticism uh, that was uh, announced and articulated the main criterion of judgment that would be employed in this context, and perhaps even invited the audience to identify and savor this poignantly sweet carefulness that would be embodied by the performance. And it also had these pedagogical reasons, perhaps. The jug itself was probably not produced for this specific occasion, but it was still regarded as an appropriate trophy for the winner of the contest. So Lillian Lawler, um, called attention to the depiction of a bird and grazing deer in the panel on its neck, which is not uncommon, but found in a series of similar onachoyai from the Dipilon uh, master. So a, a 
here here you have this panel perhaps you can't see much but it's uh, this uh, stack or deer which is standing there um and uh she conjectured that the an object with this motif was chosen afterwards not before the contest but still they it, it it seemed appropriate to choose this particular trophy to call to mind both the lightness of the dancer and the comas in which the contest took place so the religious context in which it took place arguing that this event was the athenian spring festival for artemis elaphebolos the deer shooter which might have involved stag processions in later periods they do involve processions with stag masks it has also been argued that these slightly undulating series of thin spidery letters running around the vessel in this circle like like the decorations were involved uh, were engraved with a particular dance movements uh, in mind i must admit that i feel less confident to pin down the exact festival and to find choreographic annotations and clues in this layout and shapes of the inscribed letters but it is conceivable that this popular small vessel with its round body and slender neck decorated with a single vulnerable prey animal was seen as a suitable prize for this particular context in the end the boy who won the heart of the judges with his adorable capering on that day probably died young says the jog is in very good condition and was buried with his keepsake of the impermanence of all childish delights thanks